the tabernacle. We're continuing our series, Shadows, Seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. And we are going to be talking about the holy place where the God of heaven and earth would meet with the Israelite camp in the wilderness. Do you trust that God is with you? Do you believe that he's made every preparation needed to be near to you? He's given you a path. He's given you choices that you can make to draw near to him. Do you live with this active, connected, intimate, holy presence of God in your midst? Or for you, is he, is he far and distant, an idea beyond the stars out there somewhere? Many Christians, we live like the Israelites in the wilderness. We complain in our drudgery. We are disconnected in obscurity. We are bored in the monotony of our lives. All the while, his, his presence is accessible in the center of our camp. <laughs> his holiness, his nearness, his power, his authority is available in the center of of our souls if we would just stop to see it and to embrace it to consider to behold to worship when you're an Israelite walking through the camp and in the center you see the pillar of cloud the pillar of fire how could you not stop consider behold and and worship a constant reminder of yes it's hard right now and we are going through a wilderness. Mike did a great job talking about the wilderness last week. We do face challenges and struggles and sufferings in our life. But in all the while, in the midst of that, there's this very near, awe-inspiring presence of the Almighty God accessible to us. And not just through tent and sacrifice and wash basins and pillars of cloud and fire, but in our own hearts that this same God that only the high priest could truly draw near to one day a year, we now get to draw near every day. When we remember the tabernacle, I want you to remember a holy God relating to a sinful people. He put all these things in place as a shadow to show us this is what it takes to be near to me again. In the garden, they were near, mankind and God. God dwelled with man and man dwelled with God. They lived together. There was a cohabitation of, of divinity and humanity that was severed with sin, severed with disobedience, and severed with dishonoring God and bringing violence and pain and destruction into the world, mankind's choices and the, the enemy, the devil, the great old serpent. Like they... they brought destruction into our lives, but the tabernacle is God showing us again, I'm still with you, humans. I'm, let, let's bring divinity and humanity together again. But he gave us these shadows to show us how holy he is and how serious our sin is and how it disconnects us. And every part of the tabernacle from the sacrificial altar where sin was atoned for to the wash basin where the priest was purified to the, the candles that were lit, the menorah that would never burn out showing that Jesus is the light of the world to the, the, the table of showbread. All of these different parts foreshadow Christ, but they reveal to us a heart of God, a part of the nature of God, but ultimately the tabernacle in its entirety is showing us God hasn't abandoned us. There's going to be ramifications, there's going to be things that need to be done in order to deal with the sin problem, but, I, but He's still here, and He still loves us, and He wants to make a way for us to reunite with Him, to enter into the Holy of Holies. 
When you remember the tabernacle, remember God, a perfect holy God, wants to dwell with an imperfect and sinful people. When we receive the tabernacle, we choose to believe by faith that God is in pursuit of communal living with you. That's what I want you to see when you see that tabernacle. God wants community with me. And he's willing to make a way for that. When we presence the tabernacle right now in real time, we presence it, we manifest it in our lives, we enter a holy space with God. And we can do this daily. Where our heart becomes the tent of meeting. (laughs) And the almighty God purifies us and washes us, and we become a living sacrifice, better than a lamb on an altar, because the ultimate lamb, Jesus, has already been sacrificed, and the veil was already torn, and there's already access, and and we come, and God refreshes us and encounters us, not just one day a year on the Day of Atonement, but every single day. I don't think we know what we have access to, and why it's like pulling teeth to get people to spend time with God is we forget the majesty of God. We forget the tabernacle. The tabernacle is, is, when I studied this, it's like freshly inspiring me. Like, you're telling me I, I get to go into the Holy of Holies right now in real time, anytime? This is, this is too good. It, it's so good. It has to be true because I would never make something like this up. It's so amazing. So here's my big idea. The tabernacle reveals God's desire to live amongst his people. If we receive it, Jesus is ready to tabernacle with us now and forever. The tabernacle reveals God's desire to live amongst his people. If we receive it, Jesus is ready to tabernacle with us now and forever. The first way we see that God tabernacled with us is the literal Old Testament shadow of the tabernacle. God tabernacled with us where? In the wilderness. This is is what we're studying. I'm going to show you the shadow of that and how it points to Jesus who tabernacled among us and how God became flesh, and that was a tabernacling, a a camping, a, a communal dwelling with us temporarily in his 33 years on earth. And I'm going to show you how he tabernacles with us in the Holy Spirit and how he tabernacles with us forever in the age to come. But it starts with actually knowing the tabernacle. You, gotta, you, you can't understand the substance of the shadow if you don't know the shadow. You can't understand what the sign was pointing to if you don't understand the sign. So let's just go back. Let's go back to this Old Testament reality. Exodus 25, 8. Have them make me a sanctuary. What is a sanctuary? A holy space. This is a sanctuary. Well, Rob, it's just brick and drywall. And yes, yes, but it's a place where we come together in the name of Almighty God and we fellowship and therefore we make it sacred. The Holy Spirit makes it holy. Make me a sanctuary and I will dwell among them. You're going to see this theme. I tried to pull some of these key ideas out with highlighter. So you could see that God wants to dwell with us, to live with us. This is the point of the tabernacle. In the wilderness journey, the Israelites, of the Israelites, God instructed Moses to build a tabernacle, a place where his presence would dwell among the people. You just watched that video that so eloquently explained all the different facets of the tabernacle. If you're watching online later, we'll put the link to Uh, that other video in the notes. That way you can click on it and go watch it. But if you actually knew all the different intricate parts of the tabernacle, you would be inspired again on how incredible our God is and what he had to do in order to make a way for us to reunite with him, you would understand implications about the cross of Jesus and implications about the priesthood of Jesus and implications about the sacrificial blood of Jesus that you just can't understand without some sort of shadow or metaphor like the tabernacle. So here's uh, the application for this first point. Study the tabernacle. (laughs) 
I mean, I can't in an hour give you all of this. I'm actually going to give you 10 shadows of the tabernacle, but we, I, I, we can't even begin to scratch the surface of, of how amazing some of these shadows are. But study the tabernacle. Look deep into the different parts and the spiritual insights. Ask God for revelation. Don't just take my word for it. Say, God, show me. How does this point to Jesus? What do I do with this? How do I honor you and worship you with this revelation? And then who do I share it with? Man, there's something so good about Christians being able to talk about these deeper matters of, of faith and how the Old Testament reveals the New Testament. And I mean, this is what Paul said he actually wished he could talk about with some of his churches. He said, oh, I long to like take you on to meatier things. And when he said the meat, leave behind the milk and go to the meat, he talked about some, some of these things. Like, I wish like, we could talk more about these shadows and about how Christ is revealed in the law and the Old Testament. But instead, we're having to lay the foundation again of repentance of sin and faith towards God and all of these things. So Paul longed to talk about these things. When Jesus was on the Emmaus Road, Mike reminded us last week, what did he talk about with those those men as he's discipling them along the road. He talked about how the whole Old Testament points to him. Guys, these are weighty things and meaty things and, and revelatory things and special things. And I just, I just uh, challenge you, study this. Chew on this. There's an inclination, I think there's a temptation rather, to avoid some of this. Oh, it's too academic. It's too foreign. It's too ancient. It's too Jewish. It's too Middle Eastern. It's too strange. <laughs> that's what holy is strange set apart different weird so i want to i want to just give you an illustration here let's just dive i'm going to give you a, a snippet of some of the study that i've done and i encourage you to go do your own 10 shadows of the tabernacle and then we are going to move on to how jesus tabernacled with us the Holy Spirit tabernacles with us, and eventually God in the age to come. But just let's just double-click here on the actual tabernacle. So first you have the tent. You have the, the actual fabric, and there's multiple layers to this fabric, and there's probably more here, if you zoom in even further, that represents Jesus in all the different layers. I didn't quite get into that level of nuance, but I'm sure it's there. So I, uh, homework for you guys later Figure out how each layer represents Jesus. Please, go do that. I'm, I'm sure it would be incredible. I think Mike has mentioned something to that effect to me before. But first, I just want to just, just point out that there's a physical structure here, a physical structure, a tent, where God would dwell with his people. A physical structure where God would dwell with, with his people. What's the connection? What's the shadow? Well, Jesus, right? We're talking about how the Old Testament reveals Jesus. Jesus was a physical structure that God could dwell with his people. <laughs> he was the tabernacle incarnate. He was God wrapped with not the skin of an animal and the skin of a tent, covered with layers of cloth and skin. He's, he's covered with human skin, human flesh here with us. But it's a physical structure that God could dwell among his people. So shadow one is the, the tabernacle itself represents Jesus Christ's body. Shadow two, the pillar of cloud and fire. You don't see it on this uh, illustration, but you saw it in the video. The pillar of cloud and fire. Many forget that it wasn't just there to lead them out of the Red Sea and out of, you know, during that time where Pharaoh and his armies were crushed. The pillar of cloud and fire would rest on top of the tabernacle. And when it would move, the camp would move. When it would remain, the camp would remain. What's the shadow? Well, we see later in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes by tongues of fire and a rushing wind, that the Holy Spirit is our guide, that when the Holy Spirit remains, we remain. We wait on the Lord. And when the Holy Spirit moves, we follow and we obey the promptings of the Spirit. And in fact, Jesus is 
What is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of, of Jesus, the Spirit of God. They're all one. And so Jesus is our great shepherd. He's our great pillar of fire, our great pillar of cloud. He's showing us the way when we look to him. He lights our path. He protects us. What did Jesus say in that, the high priestly prayer? I've not lost one of the sheep that belongs to me. In the same way, this pillar of fire, it provided heat at night, the pillar of cloud, protection from the hot sun during the day. Do you come to Jesus as your shelter, as your protection, as your guide? When he moves, you move. When he doesn't move, you don't move. Unless God moves, don't move. Don't Man, this is, a, this is a word for some of the young people out there that just, we get antsy to move to the next thing and move on. Like, trust me, we, I remember our first seven years of marriage, we moved seven times. Like, new city, this will help. New, new, new. It's like, and then in the last seven years, we've just stayed rooted in Fort Collins. We're not moving, right? And it's just led to good fruit, stability. Like, God, we'll move where you move. Oh, you want us to move to a homestead? That's fine, but we're still in Fort Collins, okay? We're still in Fort Collins. Like, right, you want the church to move? Okay, we'll go to Trilby Road. But we follow Holy Spirit. We're not the gods of our own life, and then we just tack Christianity on as a label. The Ark of the Covenant, and we're going to do a whole sermon on this Ark of the Covenant, Lord willing. So I'm not going to dive too deep into it right now, but the Ark housed, remember in the video, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's budded pole, which represented the priesthood. You got the law, you got the priesthood, and that manna jar, which was God's miraculous provision, and also the bread of life, which is also Jesus. So you got the law and the priesthood and the supernatural provision of God. All of those representing Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, right? He did it perfectly, and he, re, not, he didn't rework um, it. He reinterpreted it he, he, for us because we had misinterpreted it. So he, his life helped display the law, fulfill the law, interpret the law, to, and really help us understand the law. Well, what about the priesthood, that budded staff of Aaron? Well, Jesus is the great high priest. We know that. He's the one that not only took the blood of a goat into the holy place and sprinkled it, he took his own blood into a greater heavenly holy place with God in his justice and court system and sprinkled eternal, sacrificial, perfect blood forever so we never have to continually worry if there remains a sacrifice for sin. It's there, present, eternal, for those who truly believe and repent. If you don't repent, there is no sacrifice for sin. It says that there no longer remains one if you continue in your sin because you haven't truly received it. But in God's grace, you can believe it, receive it. It transforms you. You repent of it. And throughout this life, you're sanctified to look more like him, to pursue his holiness. Not perfectly, but you're making progress. Not perfection, but progress. And then that, that third thing in the Ark of the Covenant was the bread, the manna in the wilderness. Strange bread. What is it? Manna means what is it? Strange bread, supernaturally produced, but I know that if I take it, I will be sustained. Well, this is communion. This is Jesus. His body, somehow, his physical body, paid for our sin on the cross. And yes, there was spiritual realities. He's separated from the Father. He endured the wrath of God, but he also physically gave his actual body. And we, we take communion every Sunday in every house church to remember the, the physicality. Yes, there's spiritual realities and it's, it's holy, it's, it's mysterious, just like manna. What is it? I don't fully understand what communion is. What is it? That's why there's been such debate in the church. Is it the actual body? Does it change in your mouth or is it just a symbol? Well, look, let, can we all just admit there's a little bit of mystery here, right? We believe it's symbolic and we believe it's powerful and supernatural. Right? We're not going to stake our claim on some transubstantiation theological position. What we're going to say is, manna? <laughs> what is it? I don't know, but I'm going to keep taking it. Because it represents his body that was broken for us, that sustains us in the wilderness of this life. Guys, if you want to get through your 80 years here, let me just tell you, uh, it, is, it is a wilderness. The promised land is the age to come, and, and Mike talked about that last week. We're in the wilderness. You want to get through? 
you're going to need your manna. And that manna is that mysterious communion with Jesus and Jesus' bread of life body sacrificed for you. So you have all these fulfillments. The Ark of the Covenant is one of them. And really, what does the Ark of the Covenant represent? The box, the law, and the priesthood, and the, and the bread. It represents God's covenant, his promise. It's boxed up in gold, secure with the mercy seat and the angels. I mean, there's so many layers here. I can't get into all of it. But Jesus is the fulfillment of God's covenant promise, right? Jesus, if we look to Jesus, we know God came through on his word. The mercy seat covered the ark and was where the high priest would sprinkle blood for the atonement. I already hinted at this. Jesus is the ultimate atonement for our sins. Hebrews 9.12 shows us this clearly. He provided access to God, God's mercy, God's forgiveness. He did this through his sacrificial death as the great high priest entering the holy places. Do we, do we lose our slides, Evan? Number five is the altar of sacrifice. The place where sacrifices were altered for the forgiveness of sins. This is actually outside, uh, so you don't see it in this illustration either because it was outside the, um, in the courts there, not in the tabernacle itself. Um, but this altar where the sacrifices of these lambs and these bulls were shed and burnt as offerings to God. Well, this, tr this also is a shadow to Jesus. Hebrews 10, 12, Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. He offered himself once and for all. He was better than any blood of bulls and goats and a burnt offering. Six, we have the lampstand. The lampstand provided light in the holy place. Micah did a great job when he talked about light as a shadow, and he traced light from Genesis to Revelation. One of the things he mentions in that message is the lampstand. Uh, John, Jesus is the light of the world. John 8, 12. He illuminates the way we should go. He illuminates our sin so we can even see it clearly, so we can turn from it. He illuminates truth. He turns on the light bulb and gives us those aha moments, those epiphanies that we can actually understand God. And he leads us to a land of eternal light in the age to come that will never be dark again. Seven, the table of showbread. And again, some of these we will double-click on when we get to the temple because some of these things are still present in the temple, most of them. I'm giving you kind of the overview uh, today because my sermon is more about God being with us in the tabernacle than all of these individual shadows, but I did want to zoom in on some of them. The table of showbread. You saw it in the video. The table had 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And it symbolized God's provision and God's sustenance and God taking care of the, those that ministered in the tabernacle, uh, but also just his, his desire to give daily bread to his people. And we see this as a shadow pointing to the 12 apostles, not just the 12 tribes of Israel, but we also see it pointing to Jesus himself. He said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. I provide spiritual nourishment. I provide your sustenance. I'm the one that's going to keep you going daily. And then he also taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. This is incredible. It's not just reserved for the priests. Put on the showbread table, right? This, like, you can eat it. You can take communion. You can be sustained by the body of Jesus. He is your bread. You got the bronze... Laver, Laver, you've got the ceremonial washing, the cleansing, um, symbolizing the purification rites, if you will, of the, um, the priesthood. And in 1 John 1, it says that Jesus cleanses us from our sin through his own blood. So we don't just wash with holy water in this wash basin right? We wash with the very blood of Jesus. It takes away all of our guilt. His innocence is exchanged for our guilt, and that's why it's blood. When they say blood is on your hands, what does it mean? It means you're guilty, but when Jesus's blood is on your hands, you're innocent. Wait, how does that work out? Yeah, because all of our guilt was put on him, and so his perfect blood then covers us, which then means we're innocent. It's this beautiful poetic play on words the only blood that you could ever have on your hands and still be innocent is the blood of Jesus Christ. The veil, 
The veil separated the holy place from the most holy place, representing the barrier between God and humanity. I think there's a picture of it here. The veil separated that you could see the 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 blue and the purple and the scarlet and there's so many other symbols here in the tabernacle even the the trees that were woven into some of the curtains and how that points to the garden it points to the age to come and there's seraphim and, it, and how that points to the angelic realm and there's just so many things that i can't break down all of it but this main curtain that the veil if that separated the holy place right was showing us that our sin has separated us from God. And we know what happened, Matthew 27, right? 51, that the veil was torn, that Jesus' death on the cross, when that earthquake happened, it split the veil in the temple. Could you imagine this and just incredibly large, thick, tall, when we get to the temple, we'll find out exactly, I don't know how many stories it was, but it's, it's an epic veil. I mean, this isn't just like a window curtain. This is an epic veil, and it's just torn in two, in half. Removing the barrier between God and man, Jesus grants us access into his presence. And then the incense altar. You can see there the altar of incense inside the temple. The incense is where fragrant incense was burned and the constant smoke was to never cease rising it was always to be burning always going to the father and many believe that this is a shadow of prayer that jesus symbolized uh, he revealed to us a life of prayer he never ceased praying he was always slipping away to pray he was always constantly letting his alms go up to the father just like the smoke of the incense in hebrews 7:25 it says jesus is still doing this Jesus is still interceding for you before the Father. He's offering up prayers as a sweet aroma. He didn't just do it on earth. He's doing it now. <laughs> and we're meant to model and live like him, meant to constant communion, constantly casting our cares on him and letting our worries be known all throughout the day, right? practicing the presence of God like Brother Lawrence exor exhorts us to do in his little book, Practicing the Presence. So I hope you can see, I know that's just kind of barely scratching the surface of the shadows, but I, I hope you can see that the tabernacle reveals God's desire to live amongst his people. He wants to be with us, but if we receive it, Jesus is ready to tabernacle with us now and forever. The second way God tabernacled with us is through His Son, Jesus Christ. This is not just the shadow any longer. This is the substance. This is what the tabernacle was pointing to. This is what it was all about. And God becomes a man. John 1, the Word became flesh, and He made His dwelling among us. Interesting. That language sounds so similar to the tabernacle. Yeah, that's on purpose. He made His dwelling among us. You could even say He tabernacled among us. We've seen His glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. If, if you thought the tabernacle was glorious, and it was, I mean, majestic. You saw the video, things overlaid with gold and the best weavers and, and the best blacksmiths and the best artisans. They're crafting this amazing place. I, I, I can't wait in the age to come to be able to remember, and, and I'm hoping that there's some sort of like a tabernacle, you know, 3D walkthrough or something, you know, and I've done that in Israel. I've gone, and even in the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C., they have these 3D walkthroughs. You know, it's, it's got to be nothing close to the real thing because you can't smell it, you can't touch it. But man, I remember walking through just thinking, this is magnificent. But it's nothing, nothing in comparison to the glory of the Son of God. The glory, it says right here, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, wait a second, Rob. I thought there were scriptures that said there was nothing radiant or magnificent about him that drew us to him. There was nothing special. Yes, there are scriptures that teach us that in Jesus' humanity, there, there was nothing that would just instantly reveal to you in his human uh, 
form that he was this magnificent king or prince. He came lowly. He was born in a stable, right? He lived with Jewish blue-collar parents for 30 years. Like, so what, when it says there was nothing majestic about him, it means he didn't come with pompous power in a parade. <laughs> but what it's not saying is there's no glory in him. There was glory in him. In fact, so much so that he gave uh, Peter and James and John a sneak peek at the Mount of Transfiguration. You want to see the real, the real glory that's here? And he was transfigured in front of them. You got to wonder what that was all about. I think it was showing them a substance of the shadow so that the rest of their lives as they're leading the early young church, they would, they would never doubt. They would, they would know that they know that they know he's God. And then Peter later says that that encounter was not even as good as the scriptures, that the scriptures actually give you more reassurance that Jesus is who he says he is than one moment on a mountaintop when he's transfigured. So that's amazing testimony of how powerful the Bible is. But that's a rabbit trail I'm not going to get on. There is glory in Jesus. But think about the tabernacle. It's glorious, and yet it's dusty, covered in skin, in the middle of a wilderness. There's probably some, you know, there's dirt, right? It's got a dirt floor. <laughs> I mean, glorious, gold, shining, dirt, animal skins, bloody, burning carcasses. Do you see how it's, it's a mixture of glory and a mixture uh, of, of uh, what would be the word? Gore. Glory and gore. And, and you look to the cross, what do you see? Glory and gore. It's glorious. Like, this is amazing. God, even the centurion, even the, or the soldier, rather, he looks and says, surely this man was the Son of God. Like, how did he have that revelation? Because whatever's happening, it's, it's glorious. The sky is darkened. The earth is quaking. This man is unlike any other man. And yet, it's bloody, and it's messy, and it's gory, and it's earthy, and it's dirty, and it's gnarly. This is the God we serve, not afraid to get his hands dirty. A, I mean, the tabernacle was fit for a king, and yet it's with traveling vagabonds. Jesus is a king, and yet he has a group of 12 traveling vagabonds, holy and humble. Isn't this amazing? I love our king. He's like, any given moment, he could just transfigure into the, 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 the pure holy form, and yet he chooses to wrap himself in human skin. It's, it's holy, it's, and it's gory. So, Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, tabernacled among us. What's, what's my application? Spend time with God. I know this is simple, you guys, but Jesus is here, and he's wanting to spend time with you. And he's, there's an invitation to you from this sermon. Would you tabernacle with God? Would you meet with the very Son of God? He came all the way from heaven to earth and lived in the dirt with us and then was brutally executed by us and then he resurrected to redeem us and then he ascended and he's interceding for us and one day he'll come and return to save us and he's, he's doing all of that because he wants to be with you. His whole mission, his whole purpose, his whole rescue plan was, I just want to tabernacle with them. And yes, you can tabernacle with them forever, but that's not the only hope of the gospel. Is hey man, rain check, one day you'll get to be with God, so uh, good luck for the rest of your life in this wilderness. No, it's you can tabernacle now. You can get out of the dust and the grime and the hardship and the pain and walk into that tent. Whoa and get into the holy of holies and have refuge from the storm. This is what you have access to every day. Ask the Holy Spirit when you're spending time with God, reveal Jesus to me. Reveal the glorious Son of God to me. Reveal all that you went through to make it to me. Reveal how the tabernacle expresses you. Lord, I want to know more. Ask for direction and guidance and practical wisdom. So don't, don't just study. Study. Love the Lord with all your mind, but also all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. So I want to give you a, a, a cheesy little tool that I made for this, this illustration. Pitch a tent with God. <laughs> you know, sometimes you've got to refresh 
how you spend time with God. And we all know PB&J, prayer, Bible, study, journaling. We know. We all know PB&J. We all know worship, ask, seek, hear, wash in the water of the word. Right? We have all these acronyms, right? WPWP was another church I went to. It was like worship, prayer, word, prayer. But here's another one. I want to just give you a new one. Maybe you could try this. Thanksgiving. These little tools help you. The more kids you have, the more you come up with these little tools because they're like, they're at the dinner table like, we do like wins, worries, and worship. Like, can we do wins, worries, and worship? It's like, if I just did it without the tool, that wouldn't be as fun, you know? So make it fun. Okay, so tent. God wants to go camping with you. We call it, in the Bible, tabernacling. Modern day, camping. God wants to camp with you. He wants to hang out with you. So, Thanksgiving. Start by thanking God for everything you can think of, even the hard things. Fill your heart with gratitude. I'm telling you guys, this creates a holy tabernacle moment. I, you guys know that I did this recently when our van was struggling and the engine blew up. I was like, Lord, I thank you. And I just went straight into Thanksgiving. This is something I've seen in Micah's life with mighty hand. Just as soon as a trial would come, thank you, Lord. You know, or when we find ourselves complaining, that's your trigger to Thanksgiving. If you're complaining or you're talking about someone behind their back, you start gossiping right in the moment, nip it in the bud and start thanking God for them. And you'll make a tabernacle in your wilderness, a holy place where God starts to draw. I'm, I'm telling you guys, you can feel the very presence of God when you cancel your complaint and you offer up a thanks. Expression. Tell him everything on your heart. Concerns, requests, petitions, worries, even intercessions for others. Just express everything going on. He's looking for that heart of David. He's looking for the one who will finally just be honest with him. He's not looking for false pretense. He's not looking for piety. He's not looking for all the right words. He's just like, will anyone please just come to me? That's what we want with our kids. Whether they come to us in tears because they have a, a little boo-boo or they come to us because their siblings are fighting or they come to us just to give us a hug or they come to tell us thank you. Right? Or they're running to us and tackling us because it's Christmas morning and they can't wait. I don't care. Just come. Just express everything in your heart. Notation. Look at the notations of the apostles. Like, what, what is the Bible? The Bible is the inspired notes <laughs> of the men of God, and I would say women, because some of the women's prayers are captured by the men and written down. It's the men and women of God. It's their notes. You, don't you want to know their, their study notes on God? Don't you want to read their notes? And, and you should take notes. Why do, the, do Christians emphasize journaling? Because you're not going to see anywhere in the Bible that says, thou must journal. We emphasize it you, because if it wasn't for their journaling, we wouldn't even have the Bible. If, if David didn't write some of these psalms down, we wouldn't have these precious songs that we sing and these prayers that we pray. And you never know when you might write something down, inspired by the Spirit, not in the same way as Scripture, not with the same authority, but for your life and for your kids and for your grandkids, it could be a holy piece of writing, something for your legacy, something, even if it's just for you, that you look back and say, oh, remember when God did this? So I, I just challenge you, notate Write down some of those prayers. Write down some of your revelations from the Bible. I love when I get a light bulb moment from the Bible. I go write it down because I don't want to forget. What does it say in Habakkuk? Write the vision down. Make it plain. We've lost the art of journaling. Transformation. Make renewed commitments. If you leave your time with God and you're the same, it's on you. Because God is encountering you, he's speaking to you, he's comforting you, he's challenging you, he's equipping you. What is the word of God useful? Rebuke, exhortation, teaching, correction. So it's trying to shape you, form you, get you to do different things. So if you just leave exactly the same, then something was missing. I challenge you at the end of your time with God, what's one thing you're going to do different that day? What's something you're going to repent of? Make a commitment to God. Repent, of, so repent just means to change your mind. Change the way you think about something. Right? Turn your life. Some people say it means to do a 180. Okay, well, what in your life do you need to turn your back on? What do you need to stop and what do you need to start? 
Repentance doesn't always have to be this, this dirty word. It can just mean a transformation. And why? Why would I ask you to pitch a tent with God? I, I saw, I saw Candler and, and Hannah. The herons are laughing at me because we all know that what the middle school boys would think about pitch a tent. Um, but why would I ask you to, to tabernacle with God, to go into the tent of meeting? That's what I'm getting at here, the tent of meeting, to create a space in your day. Because if you never actually set apart the time, you're not going to access the very thing that God's up to and he sacrificed for, right? The, the tabernacle reveals God's desire to de- live amongst his people. That's you. He wants to live with you, do life with you. He's not just interested in you knowing about him, serving him, telling others about him, and then going and dying, and then one day being on the outskirts of the city, and you can kind of see him from a distance. That's not the plan. The plan is he wants you. He loves you. He died to make his home inside of you so that he could speak to you and partner with you and love you and comfort you and walk with you every single day so that in the age to come you embrace him and he's already in you and your familiar friends and now you see your friend face to face and you live with him forever if we receive it jesus is ready to tabernacle with us now and forever god tabernacles with us not only in the wilderness not only through his son but through the holy spirit god tabernacles by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, that God's Spirit dwells in you? The tabernacle was a prototype of the temple, and, and I'm sure when we talk about the temple, Jim's going to chat a little bit about how we are the temple, so I don't want to steal too much of his thunder here, but the tabernacle was the, was the prototype. It was the first rendition, and, and here you could translate this and say, do you not know that you yourself are You're a tabernacle for God's Spirit that dwells in you. You're a tabernacle. You are now the dwelling place. This is amazing. And the Holy Spirit is in you if, in fact, you have received Jesus. And He's your Lord. And you've made a profession of faith. And you have a regenerate heart. And you trust in Him alone. And you're born again. And you're a son or daughter of God. Then then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. It's a guarantee. And He lives inside you. When Jesus ascended, what did he say? It's better that I go. So you can have the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the man, could only be in one place at one time. The Holy Spirit can be in every human heart that believes. It's better that we have the Holy Spirit. It's best that we have glorified bodies in the age to come living in the very presence of the triune God. But it's better that we have the Holy Spirit right now than we have Jesus in Jerusalem. I'm so thankful that we have the Holy Spirit. Obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is trying to get you to tabernacle with Him. That's, that's all. When He says, don't, don't watch that show, He's not browbeating you. He's not saying shame on you. He's saying, can we tabernacle? That's not going to help us. That's, don't, don't bring that into my house. Please don't. Right? Have you ever had something or someone like come into your house and you're like, whoa, 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 not in my house. We don't talk like that, especially when you got your kids around. Like, hey, excuse me, but don't, we're not going to swear around the kids. Like, this is my house. <laughs> right? I remember when my dad wanted to live with me for a season. I said, well, no alcohol. I told my sister the same thing when she came over, and she's like, well, can I vape? Not in my house. Go out out there. Like, no judgment. I love you, but not in my house, right? Because this this is a consecrated space where I'm up to something here with my family, and and it's not that, right? So I want you to think of that. When when the Holy Spirit's prompting you, don't look at that, or don't eat that, or I've got something better for you than that and you feel like a temptation, I want you to think, not in my house. Right? When we read the words of Joshua, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Right? We think of our people and our nation, which is totally contextually true and applicable. But do you ever think of, for me and my house, we, my body, will serve the Lord. 
I'm not letting that into my eyes. I'm not letting that into my ears. I'm not letting that into my mind. Right? Three fingers pointed back at me. I'm preaching to myself. I'm edifying myself right now. Like, Lord, where have I let my tabernacle be filled with paganism? Where have I let my tabernacle be filled with... It's like a, it's like a cocktail concoction of partly holy things from God and partly worldly things and worldly desires. So obey the promptings. And not just when he asks you to not to do something. How about when he asks you to step out in faith? Confess your sin. Encourage another believer. Right? He's only inviting you to do these things so you can tabernacle with him. You can enjoy his presence more and more. Start thinking about that even in evangelism when you're nervous. Oh, I don't know. He's like, please go share your faith with that person. I don't know, Lord. I don't know. Are you just trying to set me up? Are you just trying to like... uh, Get me to overcome the fear of man. No, I want to tabernacle with that person, and they don't know about me yet. Like, I want to I camp with you guys. <laughs> like, it's just an invitation to a camping trip with Dad. Holy Spirit's trying to get you there. Okay, yes, yes, you're with me. I'm with you. This person doesn't know you yet. They want, you want to be with them. Okay, I got it. It's, God wants the conversation with you and with others, and you might be the only mouthpiece in the vicinity. So don't be afraid. When you obey those promptings, whether it's a conviction to cut something out of your life or a conviction to add something to to your life, it's because he's trying to tabernacle with you. Why do we go to church? Why do we go to house church? It's a conviction in our family. Not legalism rules, a conviction. We're not going to miss church, right? traveling for a ministry thing, okay, but like, you know, if we're deathly ill, okay, you know, like there's always grace, but for us, it's like we have not known a season in our life, even in our most wilderness season, where we did not go to church. Even when I was mad at God, I went to church. (laughs) I went to house church. I went, whether in the past it was called life group, but we just, we just showed up. Those who show up get changed, and for us, that conviction came from this revelation that God's wanting to tabernacle with us. Who are we to deny the tabernacling presence of God? That's only going to kill us. Like, okay, good luck unplugging from the vine. Let's see what that does to you, dead branch. Like, stay plugged in. Listen to the Holy Spirit when He prompts you. And you watch. Holy moments will begin to fill your life. Even when you feeling inspired to send that text or to bring that meal train, there's an opportunity there of like a holy moment. Like, whoa. 25 pounds of lasagna Robert brought over. And he, he might not know, but he walked out, and I'm just like, oh, God is so good. He loves us. He provides for us. This is the Lord through Robert giving this. This is just, and there's enough food for like several days. I'm like, man, my wife doesn't have to think about this for a while. I just, Oh, wow. It was like a, it was, we ended up slowing down. We had a great family conversation. We tabernacled with God and each other because of a gesture from the Holy Spirit through a church member. So I want to try this right now. I want to give you an illustration of tabernacling with Holy Spirit right now. So if you would humor me, close your eyes. We're going to do a listening prayer exercise, and Holy Spirit's going to speak to you. This was one of the most powerful moments when we went to the Exponential Conference. You got 5,000 pastors in a room and all these speakers. And the most powerful moment for almost everyone in our crew was when we did a listening prayer, (laughs) which you can do in your own prayer closet, but we're going to do it together. So just calm your heart. Take a deep breath in and out. That's the Ruach of God. That's His Spirit. That's, yes, I know it's oxygen, but it's His Spirit. He holds all things together by the power of His Word. Hmm. And I want you just to ask Him in the quietness of your own heart. Holy Spirit, what do you think of me? Holy Spirit, what do you think of me? Holy Spirit, why do you want time with me? 
Holy Spirit, why do you want time with me? Holy Spirit, what do you want me to cut out of my life? Holy Spirit, what do you want me to cut out of my life? Holy Spirit, what do you want me to add to my life? Holy Spirit, what do you want me to add to my life? Holy Spirit, who do you want me to share your love with this week? Holy Spirit, who do you want me to share your love with this week? Holy Spirit, can you give me a promise or a scripture for this season? Holy Spirit, would you give me a promise or a scripture for this season? You guys can open your eyes. I encourage you to share what you heard from Holy Spirit with someone uh, today in the church as we leave, but also in house church this week. Why did I do this? Why stop? Why slow down? Why do this exercise? Because the tabernacle reveals God's desire to live amongst his people. If we receive it, Jesus wants, he's ready to tabernacle with us now and forever. The last point today, God will tabernacle with us forever in the age to come. Look at Revelation 21.3. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Guys, it's the same language. It's the shadow of the tabernacle in its ultimate fulfillment. I believe that. The shadow of the tabernacle and its ultimate fulfillment will be the new age where God is with man and man is with God forever in our glorified, immortal, and heavenly forms. This is going to be an incredible day. And I plead with you that you don't want to miss it. <laughs> the new heaven and new earth, his, his presence will be accessible. It'll be finally realized. So I have an interesting application because of this, and that's give something away, pack light. This is the wilderness, my friends, this 80 years of this life. And heaven is the promised land. And when you go backpacking, every little ounce matters. I didn't trust my first backpacking counselor friend when he told me this. And he's like, pack light, Rob. I'm like, yeah, but I need the new chair I just bought from REI. And I need the sleeping pad. And I need two hammocks in case I want to make an extra large one. Or he wants to, you know, and I'll, I'm going to bring some stuff for him. Because, you know, clearly he doesn't know what he's talking about. Even though he's backpacked dozens of times. And this is my first time. And I'm like three miles into this six mile hike and I'm like, oh, this is so heavy. Why did I pack all this dumb stuff? I'm like, you got pots and pans? He's like, yeah, I told you I had all the food. Well, why did I pack? Well, now we have two sets of pots and pans. 
You know, but when you're, when you're more interested about the, the stuff of backpacking than the actual destination, you get distracted. I was more concerned with my tips and tricks and tools than I was with where we were going. And so I got stuck in the materialism of, of the camping trip and, and how impressive some of the gear was and how fun it was when after my first trip I realized this doesn't work. <laughs> I would rather go without the chair and without the padded rock seat. And without, it was so funny. He would have all this, these scrappy tools because I'd have the bells and whistles I just bought from REI or whatever, like the folding chair. And then he gets out and he just sits on a rock. <laughs> and, I'm like, and he's like just eating, sitting on a rock. I'm like, I'm looking at my chair. I'm looking at his rock. And I'm like, dang, that looks better. <laughs> Why? Because I know this, the, the weight that I carried for so long, and I just want to plead with you guys, carry less weight. Like, there is stuff bogging you guys down on this tabernacling trip, on this wilderness excursion that God didn't intend to. And I just, I want to ask you to give something away. I look at how the Markharts are living, and when they found out our van was in disrepair, they said, take our van, take it. And I was like, in tears, like, whoa, are you, are you sure? Now, it didn't end up working. The, the, we got such a great discount from the shop and our van just for the sake of repairing the asset. It made more sense. And there were some other needs in our church with the van. And so now we have some other ideas on how we're going to use that van. So we didn't end up taking their van. But just the fact that they were so willing, just like here, like they're discon- dis- not disconnected. They're detached from the things of this world. And they're going to Myanmar to preach the gospel. And they're like, they've got heaven in mind. Right? And, I, and I wish on those backpacking trips, if I would have had the destination in mind and I would have wanted endurance on the hike, I would have packed light. And so what's weighing you down? Like monetarily or maybe like uh, that's where my mind goes. But hey, if it's something else, if it's emotional or if it's a habit or pattern, give that up too. But I just think we could go a long way in preparing our hearts for heaven with radical financial generosity. And that's what Jesus taught, right? Store up for yourselves treasure where it matters. It's like oftentimes when he talked about money, he talked about eternity. And there's something about when you know, I'm going to tabernacle with God forever, that you don't need temples made with human hands. Yes, Solomon did eventually build that temple, but Jesus tore it down. He said, we don't need this. I'm going to put my spirit into human hearts and they can walk with me and then there'll there'll be a new temple with God. It's called the New Jerusalem. (laughs) So even my wife and I, we're doing a budget right now. We're cutting back right now. We're looking at selling some assets right now and just like offloading. How can we be more generous? We don't want to be so tight financially that when someone needs a hundred bucks, we can't give it to them. So I want to give you one last metaphor, and thank you for your time today. The tabernacle in the ancient sense was, was a large tent for a large family called Israel. So in the modern sense, a large, how do we go camping large? How do we go glamping in the modern sense? Well, we just get a pull-behind trailer camper. That's what we do. So I want to give you this metaphor here. Your body is the camper. You're the temple. You're the tabernacle, right? You and your community, you're on this camping trip with dad. Oh, there's Jesus. Jesus is right there with you. He's the dad on the camping trip. There's your kids, your disciples, your legacy, and you're all enjoying this world. It's temporary. It's temporary. This isn't your home. Your home is in heaven. This earth is a temporary wilderness, and there's your engine. It's called the Holy Spirit. And he wants to pull you. Holy Spirit is driving you. Holy Spirit is going to get you to where you need to go. The good work he began in you, he's going to carry on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. But many of you, you don't, you don't live like this. I mean, this, is, this looks great. Like, this, but we know that this family in this little picture has a home somewhere, right? Well, in the same way, you have a home. It's just not of this world. And I want you to start seeing this life as one just giant camping trip, right? Hold your things a little looser. And if, it, if the camper gets a dent, it's like, well, it's just, it's not my home. 
right? And you're just hanging out. In fact, it's not even your camper. It's dad's camper. You're just there. God, it all owns, it all belongs to God. And I just want to take the stress off and the anxiety off. Like, guys, it, dad wants to go camping with you. Will you go camping with him? But don't leave Holy Spirit out. Otherwise, you'll be dead in the water. You'll be sitting there with this camper shell stuck, not able to go to the next campsite and the next campsite and the next campsite. Oh, I want to tell you about uh, camping. Some of my fondest memories have been with camping. I just shared with you that camping trip with my best friend, uh, Josiah. We had some incredible connection, and once we finally got there and got everything set up and I got over the miserable hike, I so enjoyed the nature and his presence and the communion. God revealed things to me, things I was really wrestling with. I opened up to him, and, and I mean, I'll never forget that trip, the things that God spoke to my heart, the, the lies that he debunked. Another camping trip, I go with, with Bethany on our 10-year uh, anniversary we went to South Dakota and we went backpacking. Who does that, right? Like most people go to the beach or most people go to a five-star resort. We go backpacking, right? Because we, we, one, it's cheap, but two, we, we know that when you endure the wilderness and you, and you detach from this world and you can camp, there's something, I'm telling you guys, tabernacling is a holy thing. And we set up that little camp after a super long hike and we're out there and there's no one around us. And we had some of the most intimate moments of conversation and other things that are, you know, not PG rated. And I say that because, guys, there's intimacy waiting for you in tabernacling. And it, it dawned on me, I was writing the sermon, and I said, some of the best experiences of my life were camping. There was, uh, recently we went to Mount Rushmore, what was that, babe, two years ago, with, because um, we went there first together, and then we said, we gotta bring our kids back here. So the, I think the next year, we brought all the kids back, and we rented a camper, which is why I even have one today, is because that experience, um, Turns out you don't have to buy the things that you rent because you, just because you had a good time once doesn't mean you should own the thing. That's a whole other conversation. If you want to buy my camper, it's for sale. Um, <laughs> but we did go that one time. And I'm telling you guys, the kids still talk about it. The kids are like, man, bro, when we went to the KOA at Mount Rushmore and the slides and the volleyball and the, and the, you know, we went to that crazy house where the gravity was all off and we went and we camped and we went out in the nature and we were all, it's something about camping forces you to get closer to, you're like all sleeping right next to each other and one person wakes up and everyone wakes up and it's a hassle and yet you're like close, right? And then it dawned on me, one of my best memories with my earthly father was camping. It's, it's when I learned to chop wood. It's when, I mean, we laughed. We went, he taught me fishing. We were camping. and He was a different person <laughs> when he was camping. And I just started reflecting on those memories. Like, thank you, God, that you used my earthly father. And we went camping. I mean, there was one time I'm roasting the marshmallow over the fire and and I go, what's on fire? And he goes, son, your marshmallow's on fire. I go, whoa. <laughs> and it launches, hits the, the tent. It starts burning a hole in the tent. And I'm like, oh, no, dad's going to be so mad. Because he, he, up in, you know, till now, up until that point, my experience of him was he cared more about the things than the people, right? And he goes, son, it's son, it's okay. It's, it's okay. It's just neoprene. It's just nylon. Like, are you okay? And I was oh, like, we, that was such a special moment of like, he cares about me, right? And we're out there chopping wood and we're, you know, and I'm watching my dad chop this wood and I didn't really connect with my dad all that much growing up. So just seeing this manly man chop this wood, I was like, this is cool, you know, like, and I wanted to share these testimonies because if in my life I've had some of the best experiences, no exaggeration, with my wife, with my kids, with my best friend Josiah and with my earthly father, some of the most memorable, best experiences have been when we get detached from all the things in life we think we need, we simplify, and we go camping. How much more so, if you start to camp with God, will you experience some of the greatest moments of your life? If you just get a little more detached from this world, 
you start to pitch a tent, right? You start to spend daily time with him. You listen to those promptings of, of the Holy Spirit, right? You study the tabernacle and all of its implications. You're going to have some holy, precious moments with God. So here's I want I want to conclude. Um, we're going to go into ministry time. Worship team, you can come back up. Jesus wants to tabernacle with you right now, and that begins with you surrendering your heart and life to him. So I want to pray, and if, if you've never actually tabernacled with God, like you've never actually confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can do that right here, right now, as we respond. So Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that you long to be with us, that you were with us in the wilderness, you were with us through your son, you were with us in the Holy Spirit, and you'll be with us in the age to come. Lord, if there's anyone here that has never tabernacled with you, they've never invited you into their heart, they could do so right now by just praying, Lord, I need you. Lord, I'm a sinner, I confess my sin. I believe that you died on the cross 2,000 years ago. I believe that you rose again. And I put my faith and trust in you alone. And I want to go camping with dad. Take me camping with you, Lord. Help me through this life, this wilderness, to get to the final destination, which is heaven and the new age, the new heaven, the new earth. Jesus' name. And if if you just said that prayer in your heart for the first time, come tell somebody. We're going to respond now in prayer and in worship. But Lord, we just thank you. We give you the glory for this message. Come right now, Holy Spirit, tabernacle with us right now in this church service. Come and have your way in this final song, in these final moments as we give you this space, we give you this time. We choose to go camping with you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.